Welcome everybody. Before speaking about the session, before speaking about power people, and before speaking about man-to-man -man relationship, I really need to understand who you are. Then I will present myself, I promise. But just a few questions in order to get the feeling about your knowledge about power people, DAX, Bisma, SQL Server, and so on. So the question are, how many of you know DAX? Don't be shy. <laughs> Please don't be shy. Okay. How many of you are interested in DAX and many to many? Okay. You are in trouble. <laughs> how many of you have at least installed Power Pivot on their box? Just to see how it works and... Uh, okay. That means that you have installed Power Pivot but you have never tried DAX. And this is pretty really amazing. But <laughs> let's take this out. Fact of life. The session of today is uh, a pretty hard session. It's a 400 session that I delivered that past uh, last year. It's a 400 session, so it's pretty hard. Uh, don't expect it. Don't expect to understand everything. It's normal. It's uh, properly expected. Just take a look mm -hmm. at what happens. Uh, try to get a feeling about that. Try to get a feeling about. Uh, how to solve complex problems uh, with DAX. Uh, and if you don't understand really anything, it's not my fault. It's not my fault to deliver this session. But it's interesting, so we'll, uh, we'll speak a bit about it. Many to many How many of you know what a many to many relationship <laughs> is? <laughs> okay, that's enough. At least half of the title is clear. <laughs> the next part is something we need to speak about. Okay, a few words about uh, me. I am Alberto Ferrari. In the slides you see who we are because uh, it's me and Mark who we normally present uh, together all the session and all the work that we do together and I did not change anything in the slides. We are, uh, we are experts. Uh, we work, uh, uh, we are the founder of SQLBI.com. If you are interested in business intelligence, uh, in analysis services, in SQL Server, it might be worth taking a look at the site. There are a lot of stuff about uh, uh, the current version of analysis service and the next version of uh, SQL Server, SQL Server 2012. One thing that uh, should be clear, I don't work for Microsoft. I am very addicted for Microsoft. I love Microsoft product. I hate Microsoft products sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I feel uh, completely free to say that something is working fine or something is definitely not working if, it is, if this is the case. In the case of many to many, it's somehow working, it, it's enough. At SQL BI, we do consultant, we, we do consultancy, we do. It's not me, BDB, okay? <laughs> we do a lot of works, we write books, uh, we have, uh, we are BI partner, Maestro, and DM, CPM, anything you want. The agenda of today is divided into two parts. The first one is pretty easy. Uh, if you have used DAX and if you have a basic knowledge of the DAX programming language, uh, you will, uh, I will just recall some concepts that you should already know. And that not everybody knows, uh, because a lot of people learn DAX uh, just by trying, uh, as they do with Excel. DAX is a different piece and you need to study before using it efficiently. Then after, or this is if you already know DAX. If you don't know DAX, uh, try to understand at least the philosophy of DAX and the idea that are behind the DAX programming language. DAX is a programming language as any other programming language, so you will not find it very complex. Then I will start to speak about many-to-many -many relationship. I will speak about the basic data model of many-to-many -many relationship, about the problems that you have whenever you try to use many-to-many -many relationship in analysis services. One more question. How many of you know analysis services? So you know how to code in MDX? Okay. You will get more or less at home. You know that in analysis services, many-to-many -many relationship are built in inside the product, so you can create many-to-many -many relationship between dimensional measure groups without any problem in uh, multi-demand, in tabular. This is no longer the case. You need to write that code. Once you will have learned, hopefully, the data model and the DAX formula pattern, 
so you will have a solid understanding of uh, how you can leverage many to many, we will start speaking and using many to many relationships, solving problems that are not so easy to solve, but can be easily solved using many to many relationships. SKE many to many are one example, the survey data model is another example. It's very interesting. Uh, if you have already tried to solve the survey data model with uh, analysis services uh, with Tabular or with Power BI, if you want, it's much easier. The formula is a bit more a bit complicated, but the data model is much easier. And then as a final example, basket analysis done with uh, Power Pivot uh, using the many to many factor. I think that we can <laughs> Start. <coughs> if you are interested, after you have seen the session, to learn more about many to many, there is a white paper, the many to many revolution. It's version 2.0 because the version one was only about UDM. <coughs> version two contains both uh, UDM that now is called multidimensional. So if you're used to UDM, start speaking about multi-dimensional. And uh, the new version of analysis services, which is which was Power Pivot, uh, runs Vertipack, and is called Tabular, just to make things a bit more complicated. There are many more models than the ones that are here in uh, this session, and uh, they are written. So you can read them, and you can uh, read them at your pace uh, without having to wait for me to speak. A brief recall of DEX. What is DEX? DEX is the programming language of both Power Pivot and of Bison Tabular. You know what Bison Tabular is, at least the name. In SQL Server 2012, we do not have UDM. UDM was the unified data modeling that everybody should use. Nobody used it, and <laughs> they created Bison, that is BI semantic model. It's more or less a different way of seeing the same thing. But BISM contains both uh, multidimensional, which is the old UDM, and tabular, which is a new modeling <coughs> experience. A new modeling experience based on the Vertical <coughs> engine and based on uh, uh, the DAX programming language. Both Vertipack and the DAX programming language has been used in uh, Power Pivot for Excel and Power Pivot for SharePoint, which are out on the market for two years. So there is, ja there is already a good experience in uh, working with these engines. And uh, DAX programming language resembles somehow Excel. I mean somehow because uh, my personal opinion is that the only place where both languages are the same uh, is that uh, it, the formula need to start with the equal signal. Apart from that, uh, they are completely different languages. They are completely different topics, and they work on completely different uh, data structure. In Excel, you have the concept of row and column. In uh, DAX, uh, you don't have the concept of row and column. DAX is much more similar to SQL. If you Think in Excel, uh, if you want to access the previous row, it's very easy. You do the current row by minus one, and you have uh, the address of the previous row. In SQL, this is no longer the case. You have no way to detect a single row. <coughs> it has a different type system. It has a lot of function, and it is very interesting. Of course, I don't have time to speak about uh, everything about the DAX programming language. We will just see several formulas. I want to recall you uh, the foundation of the DAX programming language. Uh, and for the ones of you who know SQL, I think everybody, try to forget it for a couple of hours. Uh, and for the ones of you who know MDX, uh, please try to forget it for a couple of hours. <laughs> if you know MDX and if you know SQL, you are in trouble because <laughs> DAX uh, is completely different. Uh, you need to work with it with a brand new mind, uh, completely new. If you don't do that, uh, you will do what I did a couple of years ago. It took me six months, more or less, to forget about the things that I knew. Once you forget everything, life is easier because you just learn a new language. You know what a pivot table is? Yes. yes. When DAX uh, works on pivot tables, so the task of DAX is computing values inside pivot tables. At the end, we call business intelligence the creation of pivot table for users. We don't do anything really more complicated than that. And whenever you want to compute a cell, to compute a value inside a pivot table, 
you have some filter that is applied. I think it's easier if we take a look at the pivot table for one minute, just to focus on the concept. If you use uh, Excel and open uh, the last file that we can use, for example, this is a pivot table. And in this pivot table, we have several values. Uh, we have a, a number here, 6998, for example, 3499, which is as the cursor. This value is computed for the year 2004. It is computed for the geography northeast, for the model names for the 100, and yes, we have a slicer only for skill manuals. You can think that the slicer, filter, columns, uh, columns and rows all together for a filter, a filter that is applied to all the tables inside your pivot, inside your data model, all the tables wherever they are. This filter is applied to the data model, and then one aggregation function or one formula is used to compute this value. This value <coughs> might be the, num the sales amount, so it's just the sum of the sales amount of rows that survived the filter. All other rows are not visible inside when you perform this computation. This is, in a few words, the filter context. Now, let's go back to the slides. So the filter context is just the set of the active rows for the computation, <laughs> defined by rows, column, filter, slicers, and each cell of a pivot table has a different filter context. You can think about the pivot table being computed as a set of queries, one for each cell of the pivot table. This is not what really happens, but from a theoretical point of view, it works fine. And if you are used to MDX, <coughs> this is very similar to a tuple. You use a tuple, you put it in the workflows of an MDX query, and you are doing a filtering over the multidimensional data model of your data model. But it's slightly different. It's not exactly a tuple, but it's, it reminds you of a tuple. Then, in uh, DAX, there is another kind of context that did not exist before, and they it looks like, very like, a cursor in SQL. That means the E, something that you should not use for any reason in the world. But in DAX it exists and we use it pretty, pretty well, it works well. The row context is the concept of current row. Whenever you iterate over a table, you might have a table with one billion rows and you iterate row by row, try to compute something, <coughs> we say that uh, during the iteration, there is the concept of row context, the context under which a single expression is evaluated on one table. These two are called the evaluation context, and they are two topics you need to understand in order to use efficiently DAX. Let's start speaking about the filter context. As we said, it's defined by row columns, reported slicers, Everything that is outside of the filter context is simply not visible. You don't see this data while you compute your values. And it is defined automatically by the pivot table. You don't need to do anything. You just put the pivot table on your workbook and the filter context is there. Put a slicer and the filter context is modified without the user needing to do anything. So for example, here we have some data. The table with eight rows. We have a pivot table. Then we want to understand how that number 64 has been computed. 64 has been computed because we have a filter on large, we have a filter on green, and we have a filter on internet. There is only one row, internet, green, and large. It is this one. This is the reason why we get 64 at that place. And of course, the same applies for the other rows, which is small. It has a different filter context, does a different value. And beware that the, the filter context is not always one row. We are used to create millions of rows. For example, at the grand total level, we don't have any filter for the size. We have no filter for the color, but still we have a filter on the channel. And so the filter context for that grand total is not empty, but it contains a few rows, four rows, that are those ones. 
Okay? So filter context is very easy to understand. It's just a filter. And you already know that. <laughs> the row context, the row context is uh, different. The row context is introduced by iterations. There are several functions in DAX that provide iteration over table. Some X, other JX. All the functions that end with an X are iterators. And whenever you iterate over a table, you define a cursor. This cursor iterates over the rows and defines a row context. So you can write expressions for your table, and this expression will be evaluated during the iteration. For example, Take a look at this formula. This is some x. Some x is an iteration function that starts for the first row of the table it receives, it receives as the first parameter and iterates over all the rows. Some x of a filter of orders for where order price greater than one. What does this, this formula do? If we want to compute the grand total 192, we have a filter context, we know that there is a filter context, it's green and internet. So the first thing is it identify the filter context. Then the filter inside this filter context, the first parameter orders is evaluated. It's an innermost evaluation as in any programming language. So orders is evaluated, it will return just two rows because the filter context filters the rows of the table. And filter removes the rows where the order price is less than one, because order price greater than one evaluates for true only for the first row. The second one is removed, and at the end, you compute the value of 192. And you have seen that there are two contexts here. The first one is the row filter context that was used to evaluate this table and to reduce the data set to analyze. The second one is the iterator introduced by filter who iterated over all the rows of the table and another row context introduced by some X. There are two iterations working, not at the same time because the first one filter starts to work, completes a table and then push it back as a result as a parameter of some X. Okay? Everything more or less clear? Okay. <coughs> as you can Add filters using a filter, you can remove filters using a function like all. Using all, all has the effect of ignoring the filter context. What all says is uh, you want uh, all of the order tables. I don't care what the filter context is. So, total or amount is measured, is defined as some x all orders, orders amount. When we evaluate this formula, what happens is that we start with the current filter context is the same as before, but then all orders is invoked. All orders says, uh, guess what, I don't <coughs> have the filter context. I am going to return the complete table without caring about what uh, the filter context is. And in fact, <coughs> some x sums all the values, and total all amount has the same value for all the cells. It ignores the slicer, it ignores rows, it ignores columns. Everything is ignored by all. Okay? Of course, you can mix filters. You can call many filtering functions together. And in this example, if you, if you want to understand how that value, 592, has been computed by that formula, you always start with the current filter context, two rows. Then, all orders come to play. All orders says that the current filter context is useless. I want all the rows, and so the filter is expanded. But then filter will filter only the rows that contain channel equals to internet. And so the filter context changes again, and now we get the set of rows that will be used to compute the final sum x. Okay? Now, we understood what the, the filter context is. We have seen what a row context is. There is one problem, one very big problem, that you need to at least face when you start playing with uh, the DAX language. That is, if you were, all the examples we have seen up to now work with, work with uh, one table. 
and with one table, life is very easy. Because uh, you just put filter, remove filter, put a filter on a column, remove it, and do whatever you want, but life is pretty easy. But what happens when relationships come into play? If I'm going to filter, for example, this column, and put a filter of order data, am I expecting the order detail to be filtered too? Would you say yes, no? Yes. 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 Everybody say yes. It depends. <laughs> <laughs> the same happens for the order detail. If I filter the product code, am I expecting the product table to be filtered? Yes. yes. Have you seen that the direction of the relationship is the opposite? And since we have uh, <coughs> two kinds of evaluation context, we have the filter context and the row context, am I expecting both filters, both evaluation contexts to behave the same way with respect to relationship? It depends. We have a lot of uh, possibilities. It might be the case that the row context is propagated through relationship and the filter context not, or the contrary. It might be the case that I filter the one side and the many side is filtered, or that I filter the many side and the one side is filtered, or that no, fit, no, fit, no propagation happens. Any scenario is open, and it is very important to understand how filters propagate or do not propagate over relationships. Because you put a filter on one table and you will suddenly have a completely different table that is filtered because of relationships. The row context is very easy. The row context does not propagate over relationship. If you are iterating over one table, all the tables that are related to the table you are using as an iteration are simply not touched by the filter. So if you define a calculated column like this, we are in the orders table, we are in the channels table, and we try to use a column in the orders one. We are, have a row context because we are in a calculated column. We try to use a column in another table. That other table has a valid relationship with my original table. Nevertheless, our pivot give, gives me an error. I cannot use uh, columns uh, be belonging to different tables than the one I'm currently iterating on. That means uh, the row context is not going to be propagated over a relationship. You can iterate as many times as you want on one single table, but nothing will happen to all the other tables. The filter context uh, clearly behaves in the opposite way. The filter context is propagated through relationships. And you can see that very easily because if that was not the case, pivot tables simply would not work. If I filter, for example, the continent, here we have a data structure where we have orders that belong to channels and orders that belong to cities, so just three tables. But if I put a filter on the continent which belongs to the cities, I expect the fact table, the one containing the orders, to be filtered to. And this can happen only if the filter context propagates over relationships. And in fact, let's try to understand what's happening here. We put a filter on North America. The filter on North America, in reality, filters the country table. And we filter only New York, USA, North America, only one row from our table. But this is a filter context, and filter context propagates over relationships. So we put a filter here, and all the tables that are directly or indirectly related to a filter table fills the same filter. So only rows in the orders table that belong to New York will be visible. And the filter context has spread, has spread all over the tables in my data model. Then what our people does is that it says, this is the only row visible. You have a slicer on channel. Channel has, has the only value that store. So I gray out internet and I highlight store, because store is the only valid value in the current filter context for the evaluation that I'm going to carry on. And finally, what happens is that the, the final value is put inside 
the pivot table. Okay? All this happens without the need to do, for you to do anything. It's completely automatic, and it is because the filter context is prop propagates through relationships. What happens uh, in the same scenario if I select uh, <coughs> Europe? If I select Europe, then more than one row will be selected inside my table. I will see Paris, Torino, Madrid. So three rows will be selected. Uh, again, this selection will be propagated to the fact table. So I will have uh, two sets of rows in the fact table selected. Again, store is the only row visible, and store will be highlighted. And at the end, I will have made it computed. Okay? When we speak about relationship, row context and filter context behave in a different way. They are two completely different things. But uh, this is not enough. Uh, because up to now, I have said just things that are understandable. You can, uh, you can live with this uh, scenario. Nothing is really complex. Uh, the problem comes as soon as you start to use the calculate function. I love calculate because uh, she's, uh, she's really a bad girl. When you think that you have understood her, then she demonstrates you the contrary. There's still something that you need to understand. And when you think that you hate her, she says, okay, but you really need me. <laughs> that makes it a real girl. What does calculate do? <coughs> calculate has a very simple syntax. It's calculate, expression, and then a set of filters. What calculate does is it evaluates the expression after modifying the current filter context, creating new filters. <coughs> All the filters that I put in the calculator as parameters of calculator are pushed inside the filter context and they can replace uh, existing filters if they work on the same column or they can be added to the same column, to the same uh, set of filters or it can remove filters it can do whatever you want with the filter context it's very very powerful this was the slide i was speaking on it partially replaced the filter context the condition can replace a complete table or can replace a single column. But then there is one task that calculate does, which is uh, really the magic. Mm -hmm. <coughs> the formula evaluated inside calculate has no row context. If previous row context exists because there are iterations before we call calculate, these are transformed in filter context. So I might have a row context, a cursor, iterating over one table. If I call calculate inside this iteration, <coughs> the row context is removed. A new filter context containing only one row is created, and it is applied to the computation. This, this simple task is the key to a huge amount of complex calculation that you can carry on, not because uh, the row context is transformed into a filter context. But because the row context does not follow relationship, and the filter context does. So if you transform the row context into a filter context, what you are really saying is that I want to use the current filter, the current row context, and propagate it through all the relationships that are available in my data model. And this, of course, changes the way you work with uh, your data. I have many slides. I thought that there was already an exercise, but it's not the case. For example, <coughs> calculate for a single table. If you use calculate, using calculate sum x orders, orders amount, all orders channels, there's a comma missing here. What happens uh, is that evaluation is carried on in a slightly different way, because uh, in order to compute, for example, 436, uh, you have to compute the current filter context, it's always the same. But then calculate, before evaluating its first parameter, it needs to evaluate all the conditions. All the conditions are evaluated in parallel, they are independent of each other, and then they are applied to the filter context. So all orders channel is evaluated. The values for all orders channel are all false. 
And what happens is that the filter, the, per the filter which is currently existing on the channel column is replaced by any value for the channel column. So the filter on channel says, I want to see on the internet. This filter is removed. And the new filter context contains the blue rows. OK? Once this computation has been completed, some x orders or the sum out is executed, and we get the total of the order sum out. Final result. Everybody's happy. We have a number. Now, I want to make a very, very simple test in order to understand whether you have a good understanding of calculate or not. Believe me, if you don't have it, the rest of the session is harder. So it's better to do the test and try to understand if it's working. Let's open the Power Pivot window on any workbook. Let's go to the factory seller sales table, for example. And let's create a new column. Okay, into this calculated column, I can write a couple of formulas. The first one is sum of equals. I told you, it's a it. <laughs> Okay. Now, I have created a calculated column. Okay? The expression is sum of freight. Freight is phase column. It's big enough. The question is, as soon as I click enter, what will be the value that I will see in this cell? And this is the first question. The second, of course, is why? The sum of all the rows? Uh, oh, not the sum of all the rows, but it's not a problem. I'm not really making a test, so you can do the wrong, the wrong or the right things without a problem. Like all the columns of all the tables, or 1174? 1174. 1174. Yeah. Everybody agrees 1174? Really? Why? It's current context. What is the current context? What is the current filter context? Louder. What is the current filter context? All. All. It's empty. Everything is visible. There is no filter context. What is the current row context? This row. But some of uh, freight start looking at the current filter context. The current filter context say, I can see the complete table. And so I completely ignore the existence of a row context. I don't care about the row context. I am sum. I am an aggregator. I aggregate all the values that are inside the current filter context and I sum them all. Thus, when you confirm this formula, you will get a, a number, I don't know exactly which number will be, but will be a high number, all the same for all the rows in my table. Okay? Now, you might think that uh, you made the wrong answer because uh, it is hard. No, it's just a matter of knowing this. During one session, a couple of years ago, Somebody from uh, the attendees asked me the same question. I gave the wrong answer, and I tried to convince him that it was uh, wrong, that his power people was not work working the right way. But more interesting is what happens <coughs> if we do this. Now, she's my friend. <laughs> what are we going to see on these rows? And again, why? 
Now it's so going to be 1174. <laughs> of course, because the first time it yeah, was a so big number, so the second time should be 1174. And that's the second question is why? <laughs> Row context. Row context. Is row context? Is the row context. We have a row context. And then? Row context replaces the, the filter. The row context inside calculate is transformed into a filter context that contains only the current row. Okay? So sum will be computed in a filter context containing only one row. And this time, magically, we will have the right result. The right. We will have 1174, which is a different result. Okay? The point is that if you compute something inside calculus, you have a behavior. If you compute something outside of calculus, you have a completely different behavior. And we are working with just one table. Okay? In a few minutes, we will start working with more than one table, and you will see that this behavior, that of transforming row context into filter context, is very useful, at least for many-to-many -many relationships, which are, by the way, the topic that we need to speak about today. Let's remove the zoom and let's go back to the slides. Once you know how to evaluate such a formula, believe me, you already are very, very advanced in that. Because this is the key point, this is the point where everybody, myself being included, fails. A lot of times I still work on complex, hard, on complex formulas and I fail because of this, because I don't understand the core behavior of complexes inside the formula. And now, that we have the basics of DEX, it's time to start to speak about many-to-many -many relationships and how to handle them in DEX. <coughs> what, is, what are many-to-many -many relationships? This data model contains a many-to-many -many relationship. We have transactions, this is banking transactions. So we have transactions, type of transaction, the data, the current account, and a transaction somebody puts money on a current account, this might be your current account or the current account of your company. That means a lot of people share the same current account of your family, you and your <laughs> wife, or you and your friend, don't know. But for sure, a single account can be used by more than one customer. And so operation happens on the current account, but the customer are the people who enter the, the bank and ask money. So how much money is one customer be able to withdraw from his uh, current account the sum of all the money of all the current account to which he participates? They are not really his money, but he can manage that money because they belong to the current account. This data model <coughs> can be created quite easily in uh, analysis service is multidimensional, but in tabular it doesn't work. In tabular and in power pivot, you can create a relationship just between two tables and they can be plain vanilla relationship. One column, one to main relationship and that's all. You can create this data model, but it will not work. It, it, will, it will give you wrong results. In fact, it's always the same. I speak on the slides before. I should move. <laughs> Multidimensional handles many to many in the engine. Performance are not really great. It works slowly, peacefully, but it works. Tabular does not. Tabular is not able to even understand the existence of many to many relationships. If you try that data model on tabular, numbers will be lost. But we have that. And we have a good knowledge of facts. So we can try to find a way to express formulas in max that make the result follow many to many relationships. Don't expect to see very amazing uh, demonstration. My goal is uh, just to show you that uh, the formulas that you see on the screen uh, are really working. Uh, and you can use them in the real world and you will be able to do something interesting. But the demo will be just uh, with basic 
Excel workbook in order to understand the topic. So let's close Excel and let's open the classical demo. This is a data model, a very simple data model. Let's look at it on the screen. Okay. We have a dimension customer, a bridge table, and the dimension account, and then the part transaction with the type and the big date. Maybe we can zoom a bit less. Okay? So this is a man-to-man -man relationship between the back table, one dimension, the bridge, and another dimension, customers and accounts. You can start pivoting over this data model. Let's remove the amount man-to-man -man which is working. You put the account, you put the customer name, and then you put just the amount. And you see the result is not very sexy. Or, in other words, it's wrong. Luke is wrong, Mark is wrong, Mark and Paul is wrong. All the numbers are not correct. If you reverse them and put the customer name before the account, it's easier to understand that at the account level, the current account, Mark and Paul, is a correct value. But at the customer level, Luke, Mark, Paul and Robert, the value is always the grand total. There is no filtering happening. As if uh, anybody can enter the bank and get all the money that are available. If you want to make this formula have to work, you cannot use a simple sum. You need to use another formula, which is amount many to many, which we are going to study in a few minutes. And this works. And it works as many to many are supposed to work. Mark has uh, 2,800 euros, which is the sum of his children, but the grand total is not the sum of the intermediate level, nor the sum of all these values. Okay? It's the sum of all the amount on the fact table without filtering. Many to many has the good and the bad characteristic that it is not additive. So you will never see the correct sum if you have a many to many relationship in place working inside your data model. But these are correct numbers. This is what we want to achieve. The problem is that we need to find a way to express the formula. <coughs> the many-to-many -many DAX pattern, which is uh, the formula, is very simple. <coughs> it leverages uh, not single server management <laughs> studio. <laughs> It leverages calculate, row context, filter context, automatic transformation. All the topics that we have seen up to now are going to be used in one single formula. Next slide, we will see the formula. Keep it in mind. Don't even try to understand it. It's not important. Just look at the shape and keep it in mind because we are going to see the same pattern for so many times that it's useful to be able to identify it. Amount in many many has this shape. Of course, it's an interesting formula task. It starts with calculate and then does something else. And being a very interesting formula, it has two calculates, one outside and one here. The real pattern, nevertheless, is just this piece. The red part is the pattern for many to many. The point is understanding why it works and how it works. Let's try to, let's start trying to understand what we are trying to achieve. We start with the filter context on the customer. So the customer is filtered by the filter context, the original filter context, put the filter on the customer. <coughs> the filter on the customer is on the one side of the relationship. Something that I have not told you is that relationships are normally propagated from the one side to the from the one side to the many, but not from the many to the one. When you filter the many side of a relationship, uh, one the propagation stops. Okay. But if you filter the one side, the many one, 
that if you filter the one side, the many side is filtered. So we filtered in customer. This table is filtered. But the filter of this table, being on the many side, stops here. And the DIM account is not going to be filtered because of automatic propagation of the filter contact, which stops up the many side. And what we want to do is to take this filter and push it on the DIM account. Because if we were able to filter this table, then the fact table will be filtered automatically. We want to take a filter on the customer, shake it somehow, and push it on the DIM account. If we are able to do this first step, then the second one will be handled automatically by the system. Okay? So your, our task will be that of taking this filter and moving to another filter on another table using the bridge table in the middle. This is the formula that does it, but we are going to speak about it. Let's try to understand uh, the single pieces of the formula. Something happens outside our control. The filter is applied. So the tabular data model applies this first part of the filter. Then there is calculate. Calculate will compute this value after having computed its second parameter, which is the filter that is going to be applied to the table. And we use filter over the account. Filter is an iterator. So we start iterating over all the rows of the account, row <coughs> by row. And what are we going to do for each single row? We use our friend, calculate. We are iterating over the account. We ask, we, are, we have a row context. And we use calculate. That means that the row context is converted into a filter context. And the filter context propagates its effect over relationship and filters the table, the bridge table. Now, what happens to the, to the bridge table? She feels a filter. It's a table, it's famous. It feels a filter from the account because of the iteration. And it fills a filter from the customer because of the original filter context. So this bridge table is under two different filters. Now, it happens that if the account I am iterating over has a row here that has the same account and the same customer, the customer is visible and I'm iterating on the right account, then the count rows of this table will show one. If either there is no ID account or no ID customer, that table filling the two filters will show zero. The count rows will be zero. So for each row of the DIM account, we check whether a corresponding row in the customer table, in the bridge table, is visible or not. If it is, then it is a valid account. If it is not, then it is not a valid account. And at the end, this filter provides you the list of all the accounts that should be made visible in the account table before computing the sum of transaction amount. Okay? How clear it is now? <laughs> That's probably expected. <laughs> I want you to, tell, to just check whether you were willing to lie or not. <laughs> but nobody ever understood everything at this point. Don't worry, it's just a matter of uh, uh, moving one step after the other. Now that you have seen how the formula is going to work, let's remove some arrows. We are going to do the last step, but, and after that, it's normally much clearer. This is the amount of many to many correct. This computes the correct value. The red one computes the wrong value. And you can see the right and the wrong values on the screen. The difference between them is one calculate missing. There I have 
filter and inside the filter I use calculate. Here, in the wrong one, I don't call calculate, okay? And before understanding why the right formula works, it is very useful to check how the wrong work formula works, okay? Let's look at the wrong formula in action. We have customer, the bridge table, and the account table. Our user selects four. So we have a selection on the customer, and the customer selected is four. The system propagates the filter through relationship, and then Paul and Paul Mark Paul are selected. <coughs> this is the bridge table with two rows selected. Okay? This happened due to the filter context propagation, nothing else. Then we have our formula, amount many to many wrong. The first thing that we are going to do is an iteration of a filter against the account table. So we are iterating the account table. We start doing it. We iterate over mark. And when we are on mark, we evaluate count rows, bridge account customer. Okay? What will be the result of count rows, bridge account customers? Always zero. Zero, one, or always two? Less, less than. All rows. Uh, one. One. Somebody told two. Don't try. Who say two? Nobody says two? Oh, you say two. Oh, okay. We are here. The red part is the filter context. The green part is a row context. How many rows are visible in the bridge table? I try to get. How many rows are visible in the filter table once you know that the red part is the filter context? This is the bridge table. Two. Two rows are the only ones that are visible under the current filter context in the bridge table. And the existence of a row context does not change anything. Okay? So we have two rows visible for mark. That means uh, count rows is greater than zero, and mark will survive the filter. Its count rows is greater than zero. Then we iterate over poll. Is something changed? It's identical to before, always two. Robert, Liu, Mark and Robert, Mark and Paul. All the rows in the table survive the filter. Yeah, but the bridge table contains two rows. The question was, how many rows in the bridge table are visible? <laughs> so the wrong formula does not work. That's very interesting. So it works correctly. Or it works correctly, but it has been expressed in the wrong way. It does not compute a good value. Now, what's the difference between this and the correct formula? The beginning is the same. Filter context selects Paul and then Paul, Paul and then Paul, Mark, Paul. Now we have the correct formula. We know that filter is going to work. We are going to iterate over the account table. We select Mark. But now we are computing calculate count rows. Calculate means uh, take this row context, transform it into a filter context, and propagate its effect over relationship. And so what happens is that that context is propagated against the bridge table. And now on the bridge table, there are two filters, the red and the green one, working together. The intersection of the two filters is empty. So count rows of the bridge table now is zero. There are no, ro no corresponding rows. And for this reason, mark is dropped. Mm -hmm. Then we have Paul. Paul propagates its effect, and this time there is a match. Because one row in the bridge table survived the filter. And at this point, Paul stays there. 
because its count is greater than zero. Okay? The same happens for Robert, which is dropped. Luke is dropped. Mark Robert will select two rows inside the bridge table, but they are not enough. There is no intersection, and so they are dropped. Mark and Paul will select two rows in the bridge table. Of the two rows, only one will survive. But this is enough because the count, the count rows is greater than zero. At the end, what happens is that two rows in the account table survive our filter. And these are the rows of accounts to which Paul belongs. Now, what filter returns is a table containing rows from the DIM account table that are the only rows that should be made visible in the DIM account table in order to filter the fact table. <coughs> and that filter can be applied at once to the fact table in order to compute anything. Okay? So the basic of many to many is just of taking a filter from one table and pushing it somewhere else. In order to do that, you need a double calculate. The first one will apply the filter to your expression. The second one has the pass to transform the row context into the filter context. And this is the reason why you see the grand total in the wrong, in the wrong uh, <coughs> formula and the correct value in the correct formula. You always see the grand total because the wrong <laughs> formula does not use the pushing of uh, the transformation of row context into filter context. Yes? It's not bigger than zero, but equal to zero. It would be the amount that that user could not access, right? Yeah. If it is not equal to, if it is not if greater, but equal, equal to zero, you are searching for the negation. You are searching for rows that do not belong to the user selection. We are going to use it uh, in, in one of the next uh, workbook. And by the way, it makes incredibly powerful the, the capability to search for missing values for values that are not stored in your fact table, but you need to search for values that do not exist in your data model. So, many to many. The complexity is no longer in the data model. The data model is a plain vanilla data model, nothing strange. There is no many to many relationship with the data model, but the formula is not very easy. You need to, it's very easy. Once you master it uh, and once you learn it, uh, it's very easy. You can use it uh, and write it down uh, very easily. But you need to write it down several times and simulate and try to, to work on it. Nevertheless, the complexity is just in the formula. You need to understand calculate, you need to understand the relationship, but once you did, the power is all to you. Now we know how to handle it. The next question is, is it clear enough now? More or less, more than before, at least. <laughs> That's enough. Now that we know how to handle many-to-many, -many, let's try to see what we can do with many-to-many. -many. We are going to look at uh, just three data models uh, that we show you different usages of many-to-many. Uh, -many. The first one is cascading many-to-many. Once you tell to a customer that he can use many-to-many, -many, he will start using it and asking you to have many-to-many -many everywhere. And in this scenario, we have transaction, account, customer. This part is identical to before. But then the customer says, yes, but the customer belongs to one category, or it might belong to many categories, and I want to understand <coughs> which category, the amount divided by category, traversing two times the many-to-many -many relationship. Okay? It's not very difficult because once you get the way the pattern works, you see that you have a filter on the category. You need to push the filter on the account. It's just a matter of making two steps instead of one. Before you had to push the filter from the category to the customer. Once the filter is here, you need to push from the customer to the account. Once the filter is here, the pattern will be filtered automatically. So it's not more complex, it's just uh, longer to write. But the idea is exactly the same. And in fact, the demo, do you want to see the demo? Yeah. I hope to hear the The demo is not 
amazing. Okay. Because what happens here is that we have a, a new data, a new table inside the data model, which is uh, DIM category, which has a uh, Oh, this is too complicated. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is the next demo, but the formula is the same. You can see this is the category, this is the customer, and these are the current accounts. Okay? The interesting part is that it works. There's nothing more interesting here <laughs> to understand. There are other scenarios later on which are much more interesting, much more fun to look at. It is interesting indeed to take a look at the, the formula because the formula is somehow more complicated. This is the formula that computes uh, the amount traversing too many to many. Mm -hmm. If you remember that I told you try to <coughs> look at the pattern because it's always the pattern. Filter calculate greater than zero, filter calculate greater than zero. These are the two patterns of many to many relationships applied to the cascading many to many. And we have the first pattern there. We start, remember, calculate, start to evaluate parameters. So calculate of calculate. This will be evaluated afterwards. The first part is this filter. This filter will simply push the filter from this category to this customer. Once this filter is evaluated, this calculate will be evaluated. This calculate evaluates this filter, and this filter is the one that pushes the filter up to the fact table, up to the table that is nearest to the fact table, okay? The pattern is always the same. It's just a matter of traversing two times the same data structures. And we are going in the right direction because now we have calculate of calculate of calculate, and three levels of calculate are pretty good enough. <laughs> but you see that it's not very easy. It's, a, it's hard to look at the code and try to understand what's happening. But if you think in terms of Twitter context and row context and follow the flow, then some light starts to appear. It's not so hard. It's just a, somehow complex to follow what happens. Using this formula, you are up and running. You can do as many levels as you want. You can have 10 levels and the formula will be very, very long, but you will be able to, to make it work. The formula is very generic. It works with any numbers of steps. You always need to start with a part of this table, and then one step after the other, you need to move in order to reach the fact table. And if you have used cascading many-to-many -many relationship with analysis services, you already know that this is the only way to make them work, even off analysis services. You need to set up your relationship in the correct way, otherwise they will not work. You will have one calculate for each step, but beware of the complexity. It's geometric complexity, so if you have 10 steps, it starts to be slow. There is an alternative to cascading many to many, that is flat and many to many. There is a quite always no reason to have cascading many to many if you are able to flatten it. In this scenario, we have the account and I have created a bridge account customer category that contains ID account, ID customer, ID category. One single bridge table contains all the relationship starting from the category and going to the account. Category, customer, and then to the account. Okay? There is a problem, of course, with this data model. You need some ETL because that table will need to be created. You can solve it probably with just some SQL code, but there is some ETL that needs to be done. But the good news is that now this is a many to many factor. It is no longer a cascading many to many, it is a simple many to many. <coughs> and the interesting part is that now you have two filters applied to the table and one filter applied to the iteration over the account that pushes the, the row context as a filter context to the rich table. It works, it works, it's faster than the normal cascading many to many. 
it's not amazingly fast, but just because the bridge table tends to grow. The more categories and the more customers you have, the more the bridge table grows. But the bridge table can be, let's say, tens of millions of rows, you don't see any difference. It's very fast. If when you reach the billions of rows, of course, it starts becoming a slow. And the fact table can be big as you want. This is one of the interesting features of many to many tabular, is that they are their speed that is not dependent on the size of the fact table. You might have a very big fact table. The time is spent in computing this filter. Once the filter is computed, it is applied in one step to the fact table, and then a single scan of the fact table will compute everything. It does not matter how big it is. Okay? I have worked with several billions rows of fact table, and the answers are really, really fast. By really fast, I mean two or three seconds, so they are not immediate, but the customer is willing to wait. Flattened data mode, it's faster as a simple formula, needs some ETL. If you work with multidimensional, with UDM, it is worth a try. It might be the case that your code will, be, will run faster. You avoid one level of interaction with many to many relationship, you just flatten data and you create a different model, a different factor. A more interesting scenario is that of surface. I like service because uh, many domains are not so easily visible in service. Survey, how many of you know what a survey data model is? Uh, just a few. Okay. The survey data model is uh, very, very easy. You have customers and you ask answers. You ask questions. They give you answers, you record them. It's very easy. You put a lot of questions to the same customer, and the same question or the same answer gets a lot of answers from different customers. So there is a many-to-many -many relationship, but this time the fact table is the bridge table. Okay? We are not used to think of fact tables as bridge table, but they are. Any dimension is related to any dimension to a many-to-many -many relationship that is stored inside the back table. So this is a data model, but it represents a many-to-many -many relationship. <laughs> okay, the question that we want uh, to put to our system is, uh, what is the yearly income of consultants? <laughs> <laughs> of the consultants we have asked. That means, uh, among all the questions that we made to our customer, one was, uh, what's your job? And he said, consultant. And another completely unrelated question was, uh, how much money do you get? How much money do you gain each year? So by crossing these two information, we will be able to answer a more complex answer. Like, uh, if you answer the consultant and the job question, I want to take this set of customers, apply a filter to the fact table, and then check what these, the same customers answer to the question here in common. Okay? <laughs> it's pretty common. I don't uh, ask about this data model a lot of times. So. Because it's very generic. You can record anything in, your, in this data model. And uh, yes, it answers to more or less everything. It's not so fast, of course. You cannot expect such a generic data model to handle billions of questions and billions of answers. But if you limit the numbers, uh, it's fast enough. Of course, the customer wants to query it with the people table. So let's open the survey demo. In the survey demo, what you need to do, you need to slightly change the data model because you want to mix one question and another question. So you need to have 
tables where to put the filter. And for this reason, there is one table containing uh, question number one and another table containing question number two. They are identical, they contain the same set of data, but we need two tables to create two slicers so that we can filter question number one, that is, question number one is job. And this is what I put on the rows. Answer one is uh, the answer they gave to question one. It's not shown here, but answer one is uh, IP Pro, yeah, IP Pro. Now, in reality, there is no filter on answer one. It's uh, put on the columns. Uh, that's the reason why I didn't find consultant, IP Pro, and teachers. But you can filter it. Uh, and in this case, you will see only IP Pros. It's interesting to see if it works. Well, it works. <laughs> <laughs> you can filter just consultants, and these are just the numbers for consultants. Question two is yearly income. I want to know of these customers what they answer to this question. And these are the possible answers to yearly net income. The number we are showing is the number of customers who gave both answers. Okay? So this is the data model we want to create. Let's take a look at how to do that. As I told you, you need to create two filter tables because you need space and you need, in your dimensional model, you need two tables in order to create question one and question two. But these two tables are complete, absolutely identical. Then you create the fact table and the customer table. We started with three, we added one. It is important to know that we added a one dimension. Why is it important? Because you can solve the survey data model even in UVM, multidimensional. But in order to solve it in multidimensional, you need to duplicate the fact table. The fact table is normally a big one, so duplicating it is never a good idea. Dimensions are small. You can duplicate them as many times as you want. As we want, it's not a problem. And the final result is that uh, the value is the customer count. Uh, the fact table is the bridge that we are going to use in order to compute all the values. Okay. And we have a small problem that this data model cannot be created in Tabula, cannot be created in Power BI or in Vertipack Poly as you like, it cannot be created just because we have only one column ID answer and two tables, filter one and filter two, that both need to be related with the single ID answer that is in the fact table. In Power Pivot 2.0, you can create this relationship, but in Power Pivot 1, you cannot create, you cannot use the same column in more than one relationship. And so we start without relationship. We cannot work with the relationship because uh, the data model is not uh, feasible in the current theories of our people. And uh, thinking of the solution, you have to think that first we iterate using filter one over the fact, the fact table. From this filter, we gather the set of customers then we iterate with filter two on the same fact table. We get the set of customers again, and then we make we we'll merge them to find the number of customers who have the same answer. But the two operation, the filtering from filter one and the filtering from filter two, should work in completely unrelated way. We cannot accept that the filter from filter one interact in some way with the filter of filter two. Otherwise, the results will be longer. Okay? This is the formula. <laughs> it's not all that complicated. No. <laughs> this third part, this first part, and moreover, you can study it at home. <laughs> the first part is uh, redistributed. 
the count rows values filter ID answer equals one just checks if one filter has been put on the slicer. That means only one question has been selected. The same for the second part. Only one question has been selected in filter two. If more than one question has been selected, the formula does not work, so it returns nothing. Otherwise, we have simply for two times the many-to-many -many factor. The first time we have the many-to-many -many factor, calculate count rows, answers. Answers is the fact table. We are using it as a bridge, and we calculate count rows greater than zero. There is an additional condition, you see, the underlying part, because there is no relationship. These lines do not exist. This and this line are not in the data model. But we want to simulate their existence, <coughs> and we do that using calculate. This calculate means compute the number of rows in the answer table that have an answer equals to the answer selected in filter 2. Since filter 2 contains only one row, one row values of filter 2 will contain the only row selected in the table, and this is equivalent to having the relationship. But that relationship is valid only during this calculate. Then it is wrong. Should I say it again? <laughs> If you forget about the underlying part, this is a many to many factor. So it might be hard to understand, you might need to follow, but you know all what you need to understand it. But the many to many pattern relied on relationships and on propagation of relationship through filter context. Now we don't have the relationship. We know that we cannot create a relationship between filter dimension and part table. <coughs> Since we cannot create the relationship, we cannot trust automatic propagation of relationship. But we can create a new condition inside calculate and say use calculate. And this calculate is needed in order to push the filter coming from the customer here because we are iterating over customers. So this calculate pushes the filter from customers to the fact table. But then we need to filter the answers table even with filter one or filter two. And this does not happen automatically because there is no relationship between filter one, filter two, and the fact table. So we create an additional condition that says use filter, use calculate to push the filter from customer and use this condition to grab the filter from filter one or grab the filter from filter two. And so with only one table, you were able to take filters from different uh, tables and push them only for the duration of the calculate code. Okay? It is not fast as it is uh, having a relationship. It's slower, but it works. And you can study later on. Moreover, these controls and these controls work on separate instances of the same table. They are two separate scans of the fact table. And they will be merged together just because uh, we use calculate. We put, first we put this filter, then we put this filter. These two filters are put in end. It is slightly faster to create one filter and then the other one. You could do only one calculate. Calculate count rows, filter, and filter. It is slightly faster because this count rows is computed once this filter over the customer has already been set. So these filters the customer who answered the consultant at the question job. They are free. This instance of customers only iterates three times because the filter on customer has already been applied. And here we are placing another filter on the same table, but the table is already filtered by the from before, okay? So logically you could do them in parallel, but in practice uh, it's better if you do one step and then the other. It's not very easy, I understand. Now we have always three calculate. To go to a conclusion for the survey, 
it's very powerful. It's very compact if you compare it with the multidimensional. Multidimensional has much bigger data model in order to solve the same scenario. It handles any number of questions. We have used with two, but since all you need to duplicate is the dimension, you can handle any number of questions. The problem is that if you have more than two questions, it becomes harder to, to query because you have three questions. I don't know many customers who will be able to query a data model with more than two questions, maybe among them. The interesting topic of, the, of this data model is that this time we use the fact table as the bridge. So we decided to change our way of looking at bridge table and we decided to use the fact table as the bridge. And the relationship has been set in DAX. So we could not create a relationship, we used DAX to create it. The last uh, data model, I think it's enough. The last data model is uh, basket analysis, another very, very common question. This is the scenario, Adventure Works. The manager of Adventure Works asked me, listen, but of all the customers who have bought a mountain bike from me, how many of them have never bought a mountain bike cube? And they will break it, and if they are not buying it from me, they are buying somewhere else. And I want to know who they are because I want to offer them our wonderful mountain car tour. So the question is this the interesting part of the question is uh, we need to check customer who bought something, we need to check whether the same customer bought something else, and we have. Uh, that works, never. We are not searching for existing information, we are searching for missing information. Try to do that in multidimensional. It's really a nightmare. Whenever you need to search for missing information in multidimensional, you normally end up modeling the contrary. That says you model missing information so that you can search for them and from there you deduce that the information are missing. You can do that in SQL. This is a SQL query that does basket analysis. Fact sales, fact sales, you do a join between the two fact sales searching for the same customer that bought the mountain entire cube and did not buy, buy or bought a mountain hundred. So this works perfectly fine. And if you take a look at the execution plan of this uh, query, you see it's very simple. We have a string aggregate, a sort, a hash. The hash is done on the fact table. So we are self-joining the fact table. If you have a big fact table, self-joining it is not a very good idea. Or it will answer but with some time. We want to find a solution with tabular. First of all, we have more or less the same problem we had before. We have the product, it's one dimension. We can filter mountain entire cube, for example, on the product, but we need to filter two different products, mountain entire cube and mountain bike. So we need two dimension for product. And we create a new dimension for product. Now we have the product, which will be used for mountain entire cube, and mountain bike will be filtered on product filter. And we face the same problem we had before. We cannot create more than one relationship with the fact table. So the product filter is unrelated to the fact table. Okay? Let's look at it. Data model this is not data model. Data model is adventure works. We did not change anything for adventure works. In model name, I filter mountain entire cube and I filter patch key because I'm interested in people who didn't buy neither one or the other. In filter model name, I filter many model names because I want to check people that bought some of the bikes. I put rows and columns. 
And then I want to compute these two values, having product and not having product. Having product is people that bought one of these bikes and bought one of these items. So they both bought. It's the positive information. Not having product is the opposite. People who bought one of the bikes, but they did not buy one of these uh, other products. Okay? And not the other Pardon? No, we are not about these are people who bought a patch kit, these are people who bought a mountain tire tube, these are people who bought <laughs> both. If you want you can compute people who bought uh, you can compute more or less anything with the same data model. It's just a matter of uh, adjusting uh, the formula to do, to make it do what you want. Since it's slightly easier, we will start with having product, which is the positive. Not having product is somehow more complicated. But once you get the first one, the second one is pretty easy. So the final result, we have seen the final result, mountain virtue, mountain bike, having product, both both, and having, not having product, both the bike, but not the bike. This is the formula. And we need to spend some time to describe it. One thing that I did not tell you is that we have a problem with time. If I bought a bike in 2003, and I bought the tire tube in 2004, where should I be counting? You are not having product in 2003 but you are having product in 2004. So we need to search whether the bike has been bought any time before the end of the current selected period, and if the tire tube has been bought any time before the end of the selected tube. These numbers are from time to now. This is the formula. It looks much more complicated than it really is. Let's read it together. Having product, it's calculated, our best friend. We are counting the number of customers. And this is easy. We filter the time dimension so that we use a period to time. I mean, whatever before the end of the current period. The key is all in the filter. So the complexity in the formula is not controls, is not this filter. The complexity is just this right part. Okay? Let's zoom on it. This is just a filter. Show me the customers where some mix, some mix over product filter. We are iterating over the product filter. Product filter is a mountain, I don't remember whether it is mountain bike or mountain car tube, it's mountain bike. So people who bought a mountain bike, and for them, check whether in the table, in the fact table, there is a row, this all fact sales, customer key equals earlier, fact sales product key equals earlier, are needed because we are removing, we, we don't have a relationship between product filter and the fact table. So we need to recreate the relationship. But we cannot use fact sales for e equals to earlier, because it will not work. There is already a filter on the product. We need to remove all the filter and then to recreate all the filter to the fact table. So all fact sales, fact sales customer key and fact sales product key, in reality are just recreate the filter over the fact table. And this final filter is simply used to do time to now. We filter in time, any time before the end of the period. And we check whether this is greater than zero. So this complex controls is in reality nothing but a many-to-many -many pattern complicated by a relationship that needs to be created uh, inside uh, the formula, but is not 
more complex than the survey formula. In reality, it is the same formula. It's the same pattern. These conditions are made because there are no relationship, and we need to push them to the part table using NASA. This was a heavy product. Not heavy product <coughs> is slightly different just because we don't want to count the number of customers that have bought what product. We want to count the number of customers that did not buy the first product. So before we had the controls this thing, now we have the controls filter. Slightly more complex, but we are searching for the opposite. All the rest of the formula is the same. Why do we speak of all this about many to many? Because you can see we have the first many to many pattern here, and the second many to many pattern is just bigger, but it's always the same pattern. It's a filter, some X calculate controls. This is the key. Whenever you want to manage many to many, just follow this pattern and it should work. Okay? Question? Already sleeping? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Pardon? Is it this fast? It's amazing. There are a couple of tricks that I want to show. And uh, have you ever seen uh, power people handling many to many? No. So before speaking about SQL 2012, uh, you asked it, so don't complain me I'm going long. I want to show you what I told you about speed. I just need to find the demo that should be here. This data model is, uh, this is not a demo. This is a real world example. I have a customer in Italy that performs a broad audience analysis of the Google broadcast. So what they do is uh, they are the big brother. They control your remote command. And whenever you change your channel, it's, it grabs the information, stored somewhere, and then it's sent over the web to a central service. There, of course, there are several thousand. I don't know how many people are monitoring this way, but minute by minute, we get all this information. So we know what that guy was looking at any seconds, any minute during the day. Since we are not interested in analyzing individuals, because analyzing one individual is not useful, individuals are linked to categories, and one individual can belong to many categories. Moreover, each cate cat different categories are linked to what they call targets, a target, may, my, a target might be women with less than 30 years uh, living in big cities and having a dog. This is a real category. <clears throat> I want to understand what this category of people, what this category of people was looking at in the last three months, uh, because I want to advertise a new food for dogs uh, that is aimed to young people. Or I can do more complex question, like uh, of all the people who looked at uh, the last two episodes of Dr. House, uh, these people, I want to see what they are looking now, because I want to understand the changes on behavior. This data model is in Power Pivot. It is running on my notebook, so it's not a powerful notebook. This notebook has five years, uh, and it contains uh, 76 million of rows in the primary part table. So it's not huge, but it's running on an notebook. And the bridge table, I don't remember honestly how big it is. One million three hundred twenty-five and so on. Blah blah blah. These are not huge numbers, but again, for a laptop. These are pretty good numbers. If I decide to select uh, 
the category, for example, I can select these categories. You can see that I have stopped now. This is the result. It took, I think, three, four seconds. And it's running on my laptop. You can see that if this disk is running on a server, things are pretty different. The same data model working with several billions rows to hold four years of data is answering on server, of course, at the same speed. So whenever I say that many to many are slow in power pivot, I mean the answer is in a couple of seconds. Two or three seconds are a lot of time. That doesn't mean that power pivot is uh, always the fastest. It's, all, it's possible to break it, it's possible to make it slow, it's possible to make things not work as you would expect, but normally you get amazing speed. By the way, the same data model in multi-dimensional is the reason why the customer decided to call us, because it was not running fast enough and they were not happy with performance of the data model. So the problem is the, <coughs> the new version of SQL or the, the old one? The new version. It's a, it's a top customer, so it's working on, on the latest bit of, uh, of SQL Server 2012. And by the way, this customer, well. I <laughs> <laughs> SQL 2012, they added some feature, some interesting feature for Many to many relationship, the capability to use role dimension, role keys, to have active and inactive relationship, and to set active relationship using the use relationship function. This addition, there are a lot of other different additions, but these are interesting for us. The first one is inactive relationships. You remember, I told you that you cannot create more than one relationship with just one column. This is true in uh, the old version of Power Pivot. In the new one, you can create more than one relationship and then mark them as inactive. So the relationship is there, but it's not working. The reason to create it is speed. If you set up uh, a filter using one relationship, you get more speed than setting a filter using a condition inside calculator. So you create <laughs> inactive relationship and the formula with an ally is different and it's much easier to understand because it's calculate count rows with one relationship and calculate count rows with another relationship it's much easier to read because this use relationship filters product filter and this use relationship filters in product okay in this sense in Denali, it's much easier in SQL 2012. I still read Denali. <laughs> in SQL 2012, it's easier to write expressions that need to have more than one relationship set up at the same time. With SQL 2010, the formula is shorter, it's faster. It's not much faster, but faster enough to be appreciated. <coughs> and the basic point is much clearer. I don't think a user will be able to write it, but a power user will be. So a power user will be able to write something like that. Maybe hiring a consultant for some hours, but it's not required that the I professional to do that. And finally, I have shown all of the measures, all the computation using the count rows. Just because it was always filter where count calculate of count rows is greater than zero. I don't have time to explain this formula, but this pattern does exactly the same thing. It summarizes the bridge table, push, taking the filter from the DIM customer and pushing it to the DIM account. It's not that it is hard to understand, but it would require some time, and I think you have enough of many to many <laughs> for tonight. But just keep in mind that with the SQL 2012, the pattern is a different one. It's better to use summarizer. And as it often happens, the first time I have shown the formula, 
some guy from the development team look at it and says, why do you do something that's stupid? You can do this in another way. And say, okay, teach me and I will show people. Summarizing is much faster, but the pattern is more or less the same. And another small hint that might prove useful, you can uh, avoid using the pattern of many to many in all the measures that you create. If you query your data model, for example, in reporting services, then you can use DAX to query it. And you can write the pattern in one place and use calculate table. The pattern of many to many is just in one place and you just use plain vanilla formulas you know, because they inherit the pattern of many to many from the outside calculate table. So these measures are computed with this filter already set on the table. If you have many formulas, by the way, this is faster because only once you iterate over the many to many and then you push the filter on the back table and start computing. Oh, it's written here. The filter works on both formulas at once. The inner formulas apply that filter just because they are inside the <coughs> filter that is outside and calls the filter with So basket analysis, it can be modeled with many, many. The back table is a bridge. Relationships can be set in DAX in the current version of uh, Power Pivot, or they can be set in uh, <coughs> using user relationship in the Mali. It's very powerful and it's very interesting that it's able to search for missing values uh, more or less with the same complexity of searching for existing values. So, so it's completely different from multidimensional. Plus, there is no support for many to many tabular, but it's just a matter of learning DAX. If you learn DAX enough, you will be able to use many to many and you will be able to use it on data models that are not so evidently many to many. But by using your many to many skills, you will be able to solve surveys and basket analysis or scenarios that are not exactly what you normally use as a many to many. I have already told it about many to many and after. If you want to some links, you can go to the SQL web. SQL BI website, the Power Pivot Workshop, my blog, Marco Roth, Marco Russo blog, and if you have an question, just write anything. That's it, I think you have to remember Proxima, Proximas Reuniones Presencias. <laughs> <laughs>